provide sanitary facilities, and of course, uh, happiness, a uh, complex that should be experienced and enjoyed to raise their spirits both horizontally and vertically. This little project I'm showing you because it taught me the most important lesson uh, I think that I learned in my life. Uh, we were doing some work for a big hotelier who was also on the board of the Nityanand Ashram, which is again just north of Mumbai city. And uh, they had wanted to redo the, they had a temple and they wanted to redo the, the plaza in front of the temple and move the shopkeepers. So they built a series of shops on the side and nobody would move from this group of shop shopkeepers. So they came to me and said, we don't understand why we built such nice shops for them. So I said, did anyone ask them what they wanted? Nobody had asked the shopkeeper what he or she wanted. So we went back and we asked the shopkeeper, what is it you want? And all they wanted was a place to show their flowers. Then, because they cannot sell all the flowers in one day, they need to store them in a cool place overnight. So they wanted a small little place below the shops where they could keep the flowers overnight. And they wanted to be on the way to the temple because where they had built the houses was a side. So unless you pass the temple, you're not going to pass them, you're not going to buy the flowers. So uh, all I did was decide, chose another place and build something very, very simple for them. You can see the process, existing issues, construction and completion. And they moved and we were able to redo the plaza, we were able to pave it again. And this was taken last week, as you can see, it's almost, I think, 15 years. And the blue tarp, while it, obviously the roofs must be leaking a bit, nothing has been done for 15 years, so maybe we should look at it again. And we gave them all they wanted. This was the most important lesson that I feel every architect needs to know. Who is your client? So to get on to the next C, which is contemporary work, uh, which I'm sure every architect loves, uh, very important to do. One of my first competitions which we won was actually a project in the Soviet Union. It was in 1890, I was quite young, in the 30s or whatever, and those days there were no computers. We had to work uh, with a Cyrillic script, we had to do all our drawings, and the only country which had um, the uh, stencils was Germany. So we actually had to get the Cyrillic script stencils from Germany to do this. The reason I'm showing this uh, Russian project, Soviet Union those days, because was because um, it was the first project that I did outside the country. And it was the first project where uh, I wasn't just the only woman. There were women structural engineers, but it, it opened a lot of new ideas and new thoughts to me. Uh, how one works in other parts of the world as well. Uh, it was a real experience and uh, it, it was completed. But a year before it was completed, there was dissolution of the Soviet Union. It became Russia and then India, which actually had collaboration to build multiple hotels, uh, pulled out and we never saw the completed hotel. But working with them, once we were, you know, we struck interpreters everywhere, and once it was a very, very important meeting, I remember sitting and I had my interpreter next to me and then suddenly everything became quiet and there was about 15 minutes of talk in pure Russian with no translation. And I thought to myself, what are they talking about? We must be in really serious trouble. And when, I, when they finished, I asked my interpreter and he said, you know, they were talking about poetry. And I think that's when I realized that, you know, that's the greatness um, they love to read. Uh, and that's the greatness of architecture also, that it, it truly is a mother of honor. See, the Rashmi may not agree with me, that it encompasses everything, everything that we can do. Then, um, the next project, uh, I've always, my, one of my first schools that I did was the school for the uh, cerebral policy in Bangalore. And it taught me a lot about how to design for disabled or differently abled or whatever you want to call it, the long and short of it is that they're not able to do a lot of things all of us can do. 
So this was a client who came to me uh, whose wife and son both were on wheelchairs. And he had this piece of land in the Vasa and wanted me to design a purpose-built uh, house. He was a journalist, so we built one house over here for him and then this was his studio and we had to connect with a series of ramps everywhere to enter and another series of ramps to enjoy the garden and then of course connectivity between the house. So the importance today of being able to make everything accessible is huge. It's very challenging. We just completed the restoration of the Rajavai Tower to make a building like that, a heritage buildings, uh, completely accessible is not easy at all, but we need to do it. So we did this house in Lavasa. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, part of the country actually. And uh, very, very heavy rain for three months. You actually can't do any construction there. So you can see, um, remember the bird, because I'll tell you a story at the end. And these are just some images of how we brought, used the hill, it was a very, very steep hill, um, brought in the different roofs. Simple house, works very well for them. Courtyards, inner courtyards, rough plaster finish, uh, views of the lake, greenery, a peaceful house. And large sort of ship, uh, air, ship like almost ramps and corridors where the family could actually get their exercise and move up and down on their wheelchairs. So a differently abled house can also be, I hope, uh, attractive and beautiful in many ways. You can see how uh, the ramp goes right down and ends in a sort of a small square where the family, uh, both of them, could, could spend time every evening. So it was a different type of house that we did. Then the Landa Schools uh, was a project that I worked for almost six years. Um, very involved with the client still, if anything needs to be done, he calls me. And why this is interesting was almost 200,000 square feet we built with absolutely no air conditioning. Finally, the principal felt almost embarrassed, felt he needed an air conditioner, and the computer labs which we just put in. We used double walls, we used uh, natural stone, we used jalis, we used pergolas, all the things which I showed you in the beginning, the same elements, the same ideas running through the entire project. So it was a carrot field and uh, I believe we have to tread the land lightly. Um, I wanted to have used the local materials, so we used a lot of brick. But unfortunately, like many things that are happening in India today, the craftsmen, not just for crafts as we imagine in fabric or, or metal or wood, but architectural craftsmen are disappearing. And when we wanted to have the vaulted roofs, which you can see over here, it was almost impossible for me to get craftsmen to actually build the brick vaulted roofs. I finally had to speak to some of my friends in Ahmedabad, and we were able to get craftsmen, a workman, the craftsmen actually, to come and uh, do the roofs for us for all the corridors. We used all natural stones, you can see the pergolas, we planted, uh, saved all the trees and planted a lot of trees very close to the buildings, which was another way that uh, it cools the buildings around since nothing was air conditioned. There were many, many courtyards, a series of courtyards with small courtyards. And the philosophy of this school is very guardian. Uh, they believe the children of the school have to clean the school, they have to keep the bathrooms clean, uh, they have to keep their classrooms clean, the corridors clean. So the design was worked out in such a way with multiple small courtyards. So different groups of children uh, looked after their own courtyards. And of course this jumba tree has grown enormously big now. And this was the last, uh, uh, the big courtyard of one of the schools where the children would gather. And you can see over here, they actually move with the sun. It's big enough. So there's some part of the courtyard which is always in shade. It, it's used for connection spaces, it's used for cycling for the children, um, all natural materials, we use kota and, and stone. These are the jalis uh, to let air flow through easily through the different areas. And a sense of breakout spaces of interest, of connectors, even the parapets were, were perforated and the children have a lot of fun 
going through um, the different parts of the school. There's some images here looking through. And again, the sandbreakers. So as we move to each school, there are four schools, the scale changed, the scale got bigger and bigger, but the principles and the architectural vocabulary remain the same. And the principles of, of natural ventilation, natural air, natural materials, absolutely no air conditioning remained. Uh, the children love their school. Uh, they, they actually send me a lot of drawings you can see even today. Uh, so they, they interact with it. So obviously, it must be special for them. Uh, the religious buildings are very, very important, but um, there is a bit major problem today uh, in the farms. This is a tiny little church that we did uh, in Navi, Mumbai. We had a very, very small piece of land. It was so small uh, and they needed to have quite a few um, worshippers. So we actually put the cross on the compound wall, you can see here, and we created a small courtyard, we glazed this, and then this became the church itself. It was so small that we couldn't even put the cross inside the church. So just to show you um, how even our challenges are many and each project has to be appropriately addressed. Um, we used the sculptural quality of the building itself uh, to tell the world that it is a religious building and um, the bell was donated by, uh, actually from Germany, they sent the brass bell. And you can see the cross here uh, on the compound wall outside, outside the, the building itself. And this was at the dedication ceremony of the church. IT campuses are huge, we're doing lots of them. I've chosen just one to show you. Uh, because again, we used very, very eco-friendly methods. We also used courtyards, traditional courtyards. We used water to create microclimate. This is in Pune, which is very, very dry and hot. And uh, uh, it was started for 2,500 engineers and ended up, like many IT campuses today, for double the number as the engineering requirements increased. So we used the natural Nevasa stone. And this is a microclimate we created. Pune is very, very dry um, and also very hot. So these are some of the natural ways we ventilated the entire campus uh, using natural stone, brought the greenery inside some of the buildings itself. And we sunk courtyards, but in a contemporary context, so that the rooms around, again, were not air-conditioned. Only the workstations were air-conditioned over here. So there are many ways that, that one can look I personally don't believe that you are uh, in LEED certification where you have glass blocks and then you provide mechanical systems to cool it um, and then say that you're eco-friendly. That's not going to work in a country like ours. We have too many people, we don't have enough money and that's not going to be the answer. We have to think of our own uh, intuitive and um, traditional and modern innovative ways to address this. The third was, is culture, just a quick uh, run through. Crafts and arts have always played a very important role. In Germany, 2% of the cost of construction has to be kept aside for artwork. It could be contemporary art. In our country, if every builder or if the government gave us 2% of the cost of construction for crafts, what could we do? It's not enough to keep the craftsmen going with their existing craft because that's not going to enable them to continue. We have to, uh, to work with them in architecture because that's going to be the answer to scale them up, to make them more contemporary, to make them innovative and to give them the confidence that they can do things in urban areas. Because as I come to the city, you know, we all know what's going to happen in the future in our country. So this is um, the Cathedral School, Mario Miranda worked with us and he did three wonderful, most of you have heard of him I'm sure, three wonderful drawings which you can see at the back. And at the end the school wanted to put a, a sort of a laminate or plastic in front of it. They were worried the children would spoil it. And Mario said, no, no way, if the children spoil it, I'll go back and I'll redo it. And nothing has happened in 10 years. So this shows if something good is done we will just, like one part of the street is clean, it will not get dirty, but if you see another part that's dirty, it gets dirtier. 
So it's the same philosophy which works. We work with lots of craftsmen. You can see I'm obviously giving him a very hard time over here. This was for a hotel that we were doing. And um, we used the, the Indian script to, to work on everything within the hotel. Uh, this was in uh, a hotel also in uh, Rajasthan. When we, when we as architects go and work in a, in a site which is outside the city, when we leave, people should be happy that we have come there. Uh, how do we make that possible? We make that possible by using them in the construction, by using them in the crafts, and by finally employing them in some way within the organization. And this is what we did. This was a club Mahindra resort in Kumbhanga, which those of you who haven't seen it has got to be the most magnificent fort in India. And we use all local craftsmen. I can't show you so many pictures, but even though they did funny things, they overdid the, the painting, they did some awkward looking peacocks with funny feet, all sorts of things, but it does not matter. And here they are working on the stone. And then of course we get Madhubani painters right from the heart for some of our projects. And it gives them so much of, of, of support and, and feeling that their art is worth preserving. So this was a building in uh, Aliba we used uh, where we look at that. I mean, look at the birds and the tree and the fruits uh, that they have. And this was uh, for TCS. We restored one of the three of their old bungalows. And uh, we had to do the interiors uh, in a contemporary way. So David D'Souza's book on the Mumbai itinerance, we used his images to, in glass, we converted it from photography into glass, and in different ways we used it uh, in the interior of the, of the building there. Uh, this was, of course, in Russia, where the peacock uh, played its role in the Russian uh, stonework. This was an interesting project because it's a collaborative project which I'm doing with uh, some New York architects. And this is also for TCS who have always supported us with the artwork. We had to create large, large panels like this in contemporary ikat. So we went to Women Waves and they set up four weave, uh, weaving looms in four different parts of India, north, south, east, west. When they went to the weavers, they said there's no way we can weave such large pieces. Forget it. But they actually created, built these large looms and they wove these huge, enormous panels which we have all over uh, the IT campus over there. You can see us uh, standing behind one of them. Uh, it was a lot of effort, but you can imagine um, what it does in terms of confidence, in terms of contemporizing what we have inherited, and the ability to use all these things as we move forward. We have just completed the textile gallery at the museum here in, uh, in the Prince of Wales, Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum. And uh, I'm sure many of you have gone and seen it, so I won't elaborate further on that. Construction and labor, coming back to culture, because culture encompasses all this. Um, the, the women, the women construction labor, construction labor perhaps is the most deprived labor in our country. It's not organized labor, and uh, it, it's, the women are even, even more uh, underprivileged. And uh, I always used to wonder about how they worked. And um, once, uh, when I was actually seven, eight months pregnant, I was climbing to a roof uh, when I was doing one of a uh, building in Mumbai. And I remember the women looking at me and uh, <coughs> empathizing with me. And ever since then, I've always wondered about them. So finally, I asked them, how do you work? Because now children, they used to bring their children to my side. So I said, you can't do that. So finally that stopped and I said, how do you all, what do you all do? So they said, what we do, a group of us get together and one of us stays back and we share the money that the six of us earn with the seven and she looks after the children for the day. And after that, um, I worked quite hard. I introduced it in my specifications, in my tender documents that they had to have a place, they had to have at least one single light, they had to have water so that they could bathe after coming back a whole day of work in cement and concrete. And I, I hope with all the skill development that's taking place that uh, and I'm working in it in a quiet way, that 
that women today will not just be carrying concrete on their heads, that there will be women painters, there will be women masons, there will be women welders, like you have in many other countries of the world. And uh, let's hope that, that this is a big change that has to come into the construction industry as well. So this is a group of women uh, with some of us at our, uh, we've just finished the Goa Institute of Management in Goa. And uh, we actually built a school. Uh, we insist that the contractor also has a school for the children. So this is what he did. It can't be a school. I, I think I should use that word. But it's a classroom. So where they have the different uh, children of different ages who are on the site. They make enough money, the contractors. They can jolly well do this. And we do inspect uh, all the uh, construction sites, uh, what they are providing for the labor. So that is as far as the women labor are concerned. But what about the women architects? Uh, I started a foundation in, in 2000 called the HECAR Foundation, which is an acronym for Heritage, Education, Conservation, Architecture, and Restoration. And apart from bringing out uh, various books, which we do, one of the most important things was in 2000, uh, we had uh, organized a conference for women architects. In 1990, I thought that maybe I would like to do it, and I wrote out on my own to many, many women, uh, but got absolutely no response because there was a pre-qualification that the women's work should have been done by them themselves, not in a form where they had a brother or a father or a husband working with them. Ten years later, in 2000, I wrote out a similar letter, and the response was huge. So that shows how India.